What so proudly we held at the twilight's less gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there bow your heads with me. Almighty God, we're grateful to take the time on this Friday just to celebrate the contributions that African Americans had made, not only to this great nation, uh, but to this great army. We ask for sweet fellowship today as we commune together. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everybody. How are we doing? Major General Johnson, Sergeant Major Christian, Ms. Wilson, Honored guests, commanders in the Fort Jackson and Columbia, South Carolina community. We say a couple of things here, and for I just want for our guests, this is, uh, this is unrehearsed, but for our guests, I just wanted to let you know, so when, when people ask you know, it, for the Army, where does victory start? The folks in this room know where we're going with this, and we say victory starts here, right, right here. here. All right. Yeah. So welcome to the 2018 African American Black History Month Observance. It is my honor as the commander of the Lightning Brigade to host today's luncheon where we recognize the contributions of African American community in the times of war. The African American Black History Month was established by law in 1976 and is observed during the entire month of February every year. It's a time to celebrate the achievements and contributions of African Americans to our great nation. This year's theme is African Americans in times of war as the year marks the centennial of the end of World War I. This year specifically commemorates military accomplishments of the African Americans throughout history, highlighting their service and sacrifice spanning from the Revolutionary War to present day. So again, thank you for joining us today. I hope you enjoy this afternoon's events, the great food that the NCO Club has put together for us, and have a great lunch. Thank you. Cool. From the beginning of this country's foundation, Crispus Attucks was the first casualty to lead the country yearning to be free. The black men and men fought in April of 1775 to keep the dream alive, hoping that the emancipation that they did strive to ensure that a better day of equality would be available for you and me. The first Rhode Island Regiment gave sentiment to the idea that Americans will stand and fight, invoking the might to erase the wrong and correct the right and bring light to what's right, proving that if given a chance, they will ensconce an attitude of latitude and not elude the battle for freedom that at times must be won while keeping the equality for all in sight. Encompassed with bravery, divulge before during and after slavery, defined that it's actual and factual, the mighty 54th Massachusetts charged Fort Wagner as the Swamp Angels. In the face of danger to 
ensure that the old flag would never hit the ground with simple heroic abilities. Tried and true as the red, white, and blue, the Buffalo soldiers commanded authority, forged positions of seniority, while at the same time, in the eyes of the Cheyenne Native American Indians, wars were being won. While William Canty, who was also Kathy Williams, became the first female Buffalo soldier. Despite the inequality of being a woman, she fought bravely with her weapon still in hand. The Tuskegee Airmen of the three 32nd fighter group flew 15,000 sorties in a two-year span with inferior planes that were slower that the Germans had in hand, yet under their command, they're still on top of the utmost escorted bombers in the history of our country. Let it stand that the Red Tails are the ones that never bailed on their fellow comrades that they protected from their simple homeland. Power Hot and Betty, Andrew Xander Kelly, Edward Baker, and John Denny, all cited for heroic acts of bravery allied to many that were unsavory, yet given the Medal of Honor because they earned for the lack of concern that they had for their own individual safety. Throughout American's history, from the Battle of Lexington to the Battle of Fallujah, African-American soldiers have honorably served when called to duty. Serving great valor with distinction in America's times of war. Yet we have risen to the occasion to keep freedom's eagle and make sure that it continues to soar. Willing, ebby, and ready, war willing to sacrifice our lives to serve and protect the American way of life, able to lead and comprehend, execute and accomplish any task that has been set before us, ready to defend, protect our freedoms against all enemies, foreign and domestic. We are relentless.
This practice is going on for time immemorial, and it continues to this very day. When people learn to keep animals to meet some of their needs and use were found for the skins or hides that we used to make drums, they were pegged to the ground, and then they were stretched to dry. And to check on them, as the afternoon wore on, four men with long whips would take turns, rhythmically beating them as they circled in counterclockwise direction. These were the forebearers of all musicians and all drummers who were called the Alawo. One day, one of the Alawo was on his way to the next village to visit his family. And as he traveled along the lonely footpath that joined town to town and village to village, he heard a voice that said, Alawo, why? Which meant Stimpy to come. The man turned around, but he didn't see anyone, so he walked on. And then the voice said, Alawo, Babawa, which meant Stimpy to come back. And so the man walked back and from a tree that strangely grew along the path, he heard a voice. And it said, Alawo, I am the spirit of music. There's a hollow in the tree. That's where I live. Please cut it down so that I can escape, and I promise I will teach you how to make something that can be understood by all humankind. Now, this is important. Then, as it certainly is today, so the man quickly took his machete and cut the tree down. And true to his word, according to legend, the spirit of music first appeared and taught the man how to make the very first musical instrument. As you might imagine, it was a drum. The spirit of music showed him how to cut the tree, and the same as above from his knee to his heel, it showed him how to further hollow out the section of tree, how to attack some of the skin or hide, and then it showed him how to make sounds with this curious looking thing, especially those that imitated the human voice. But it told him, from now on, you must call yourself Oni Lu, which is the Yoruba word for drummer. And the spirit of music went further to say to the first drummer, who, by the way, we call Baba Oni Lu, father of the drum. When you play your drum, think of your song, and I will sing it for you. When people hear it, they'll come together as one. They'll learn new important things, and they will be made better prepared to stand the test of time. So when Baba got back to his village, he played the drum for the first time. I can imagine it sounded a bit like this. for the first time we were alive. 
the feet move through our bodies and push out through our hands. That is how our drum was born. The drum spoke to the animals and to the people. The earth's heart beat out the rhythm of all there is. We listened and sounded it back for her to hear. Then, men from another continent came, men who would not listen to the rhythm of the earth. And they shackled us and flung us into the belly of ships, bringing us enslaved across oceans and seas. They tore us apart from one another and did not allow us to speak our own languages. We were a lost people. We were no longer free. We thought we were no more. Then, they took the drums away. But cruelty cannot stop the earth's heart from beating. It moved through us still and pushed not only out of our hands, but out of our entire bodies. And we became the drums, living drums beating for the whole world to see and hear. We were alive and we would always be free. So when we walked along the path, or worked in the fields, we made our feet drums. When we sang our songs in the moonlit skies, or spoke to one another, we made our voice drums. When we stitched our quilts or invented things, we made our hands and our minds drums. When we created our music, dance, painting, sculptures, and theater, we made our art drums. When we fought for our liberation and for our civil rights, we made our courage drums. And when we fought in the American Revolution, the Civil War, World War I and II, the Korean War, Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq, we made our bravery drums. We are the Earth's people living drums, beating for all the world to see and hear. We are alive, and we will always be free. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to share an African proverb with everyone. Please do everything I do, and repeat after me. Everyone say peace, peace. peace. Love. love, respect, respect. For, everyone. for everyone. The only time the only time you look down on someone, you look down on someone. It's when you are leaning over. It's when you're leaning over to pick them up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Second Jesus, we got just a few minutes, right? Three minutes, great. Then this is your part. We want y'all to help us sing a song of welcome, a song that will welcome our, our uh, keynote speaker. The song is called Fool on Lafayette. It's sung in two parts, call and response. We'd like for uh, my beautiful wife, Miss Eleven Lou Adi Tutu, to make the call. Give her a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And the rest of us, in the tradition of the African, will make the response. So when she says, Fool on Lafayette, our response is going to be, Ashe, Ashe. Are you guys ready to be with me? Fool on
pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Ms. Teresa Wilson. Ms. Wilson is a friend to Fort Jackson and an integral member of the great partnership between the military here, Fort Jackson, and the City of Columbia. She's the city manager for the great City of Columbia and leads the city's executive team who works diligently to address needs of residents in the community while focusing on public safety and economic development. Her leadership has been instrumental to the city which is most evident during the flood of 2015. During that flood, her efforts ensured 24-hour operations in place to meet the needs of the residents that were impacted by the flood. Ms. Wilson is a well-known leader who has received numerous accolades and acknowledgments for her professionalism and leadership. And it is my pleasure, please join me in a warm Fort Jackson welcome to Ms. Teresa Wilson. very well prepared by Colonel Asplund and others and Sergeant Jenkins, but they failed to tell me I was going to have to follow the Orisi Risi <laughs> entertainment. So I'm going to, you know, the, the bar's been set pretty high. That was great. <laughs> um, first, I would like to applaud your commitment, General Johnson, to serve all the residents of these United States by protecting our interests both here domestically and in foreign countries. It's indeed my pleasure to stand before you today and say thank you. Um, as Columbia City Manager, I know the impact you all have on our community, and without a doubt, it is a true partnership that we have with you, and we would not be the vibrant, multicultural, metropolitan city we are without the Fort Jackson Army Base and the thousands of soldiers that have trained here. And I want you all to give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> Allow me this moment to acknowledge Major General John Johnson, Command Sergeant Major Lamont Christian, Colonel Patrick Asplund, and Command Sergeant Major Raymond Harris for being in attendance today and all of the other um, honored um, guests. I would also like to recognize my family members who are here with me, my parents, Dr. and Mrs. Steve and Teresa Hendricks Wilson, um, my fiance, William Reginald Bryce, and my daughter's in school today, so she didn't get allowed to play hooky and come hang out with us, but she's a ninth grader and needs to attend to that today. Um, and I certainly could not do anything that I do on a daily basis or accomplish um, my days without my team, and many of them are here today. So our public and media relations staff led by Ms. Leisha Yutzi is here with us today as well, and I thank them for that. I want to thank Colonel Patrick Asplund and Sergeant First Class Asada Jenkins, as well as Command Sergeant Major Raymond Harris um, for visiting with me last week um, in preparation for this program. Usually when I accept speaking engagements, um, my staff or I receive just an email or a phone call, and um, that's usually sufficient. But look, you guys do it right. I have I've never experienced such um, you know preparation and assistance for an engagement that I have, and I certainly appreciated that. So when a colonel requests a meeting with you in advance of speaking during a Black History Month program, now that makes you feel pretty important and that I needed to make sure I was very well prepared to be here. So I hope I will accommodate with the speech. Um, I will try my very best. So turning to the purpose for why I, why I was asked to come. As we commemorate the end of World War I, 100 years ago, just about, 
And in keeping with your theme, African Americans in times of war, we can all acknowledge the specific and unique issues faced by African Americans in times of war. My research indicates that even though all soldiers have had the potential to give the ultimate sacrifice and service, opportunities for advancement have not always been as procedural and systematically afforded to soldiers of color. African American servicemen and women have encountered challenges and have found it cumbersome at times to follow the regimented path to success where others may have had little to no setbacks in advancing in the ranks. I also read that even in death, African American soldiers were not always documented and memorialized within public and private spaces. In addition, and from my own personal experiences as Columbia City Manager, it is evident that government, public, and private sectors need to develop better solutions for our veterans when they return from service, including our present day war against terrorism. But these solutions are occurring, and so I think we have a lot to be proud of. We have a lot of work still to do, but we are making a lot of progress just by looking across this room at all of the advancements and all of the work that's being done here at Fort Jackson. Even today, I'm, I'm pleased to note that as we fellowship here for lunch, our community came together with Fort Jackson to ensure a proper funeral and burial with military honors for two homeless veterans from, the, from right here in the Midlands. And that service from my understanding is going on as we speak. Uh, here at the Fort Jackson National Cemetery. Our partnership with Fort Jackson is strong and we will do everything we can do to keep it that way. This institution is doing so much to properly train military personnel and highlight the accomplishments of all of you men and women who serve. I'm particularly moved, I think, by the fact that not only are is the fort doing things to um, raise and lift you up as you're going through this process. But through this program this month, I found it interesting that you're also highlighting the examples that came before you all. For example, the poster that's featured for the African American History Month is of service members highlighting various times in history and some of the things that African Americans have done. For example, the poster includes Private Kathy Williams, the first black woman to enlist in the Army. Private Howard P. Perry, the first black man to enlist in the Marine Corps. Major Charity Adams, leader of the only African American Women's Army Corps. The Golden 13, the first commissioned officers in the Navy. Fireman First Class Marvin Sanders, a World War II Coast Guard officer. Second Lieutenant Marcella Hayes, the first black female pilot in the armed forces. General Colin Powell, the first black chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and Second Lieutenant Emily Perez, the first female graduate of West Point to die in Iraq and also the first combat death from the 2005 graduating class. This day has also given me the opportunity to reflect on those in my life who have also served. My three uncles, my mother's brothers, all served together in Vietnam, which I find interesting. We talk about it often that back then, three um, family members could serve at the same time. So I'm sure my granny was pretty worried those days, but they were doing their, their service to country. Clifton Hendricks was in the Navy Lamaris Hendricks, who's now deceased, was in the Navy, and Victor Hendricks was in the Marines. My father, Dr. Steve Aaron Wilson, Army, was in one of the last draft rounds in the early 1970s. And he talks often about, at the time, I don't know that he was too excited about it, but it was the best thing that ever happened to him. And now, as a career educator, over 40 years of experience, a current superintendent of schools, um, he says that's one of the things that 
our young people need to still have um, as an opportunity if they don't so choose to take it. Um, looking back, he thinks that's some of the best experience that could have been given to young people. Uh, my dad, upon completion of active, of active duty, continued to serve in the Army Reserves right here at Fort Jackson, rising to the rank of major. And both of my parents are longtime career educators who believe in discipline and <laughs> community service. So I think that might have a little bit to do with what I do now for my work. My fiance, William <laughs> Reginald Bryce, was in the Army. He served in the first Gulf War, Operation Desert Storm, and was awarded the Bronze Star. He worked in Iraq from 2003 to 2012 with Vertex Aerospace conducting aviation maintenance. And in addition, he was recruited by CSE to manage the CIED defeat program. Now I have noticed as I have attempted to pull this information even out of my family members that you all are a very humble bunch. You don't really like to talk about your achievements and I can appreciate that. But sometimes it's certainly worthy of sharing your accolades because I think for our young people, they need to see that, they need to know it and understand the opportunities that they also have to achieve. So I appreciate you all letting me share a little bit and brag a little bit because all of the things that you all are doing are certainly worth bragging about. Now I would like to focus on one of this year's featured African American service members who happens to be a woman. Yes, I chose the female on the poster, one of them. Um, because I do think, as I said, these stories are worth sharing. The picture of Second Lieutenant Emily Jasmine Tatum Perez caught my eye and then her story pulled at my heartstrings. As I reviewed the biographies of each of the servicemen and women on this year's poster. Emily came from a military family and spent her childhood in Germany. She returned to the States in 1998. From early on, she wanted to become a soldier. At Oxen High School, she was the wing commander of her junior ROTC. She was a captain of the Oxen Hill High School track team and graduated near the top of her class in 2001. Emily helped start an AIDS ministry at her church and after watching family members who had cont contracted the virus, she also volunteered with the Red Cross HIV AIDS peer education program to talk with teenagers about her stories of people close to her living with the depression and stigma of AIDS. At West Point, Emily was part of the class that arrived two weeks before the September 11th attacks in New York, Pennsylvania, and DC that brought the threat and possibility of war home for many Americans. As a member of the class of 9-11, as they were often called, she held the second highest rank in her senior class. As Brigade Command Sergeant Major, she held the distinction of being the highest ranking minority woman in the history of the US Military Academy. She was a medal-winning athlete and top-ranked cadet. She chose global health issues, which was true to her work as an HIV AIDS peer educator. And once she was enlisted, she signed up for the officer basic training of the medical corps. Her home church pastor is quoted in a Baltimore Sun article that just before Emily was to be deployed to Iraq, she flew from Texas to Maryland to be a bone marrow don donor for a stranger because she was a match. After graduation from West Point in 2005, she was assigned to the Army's 204th Support Battalion, 2nd Brigade, 4th Infantry Division as the platoon leader. Her life as a Medical Service Corps officer was cut short at the age of 23 in Iraq on September 12, 2006, when an improvised explosive device detonated near her Humvee. In a Time Magazine article, Emily's friends talk about her faith and that every Sunday morning she'd wake up playing gospel CDs as she read the Bible. 
and Emily is buried in section 36 on a high bluff overlooking the Hudson River alongside two centuries of fallen graduates from the United States Military Academy. According to the Washington Post, Emily was the 64th female member of the U.S. military to be killed in Iraq or Afghanistan and the 40th West Point graduate killed since September 11th, 2001. What's unique about Emily's story is that she was able to attend the prestigious West Point. Emily's matriculation at West Point was made easier by predecessors like Henry Ossian Flipper, the first African-American cadet to graduate from the United States Military Academy. It is reported that Flipper was never spoken to by a white cadet during his four years at West Point but we are certainly grateful to men and women like Henry Flipper and like Emily for persevering when they could have given up. And I think all of us know stories like theirs, but again, I think it's so um, important that we remember them and we use these opportunities to tell their stories. In death, Emily was afforded an opportunity to be documented and memorialized in a public space which hasn't always been offered to servicemen and women from previous wars. Corporal William Anderson of the 54th Massachusetts Infantry and Privates Greenberry Stanton and John Nelson, both of the 5th Massachusetts Cavalry, were buried with full military honors as well in Indian Town Gap National Cemetery in November of 2016, after being buried for more than 130 years in a private backyard graveyard in Pennsylvania. These African-American Civil War soldiers served as part of the first regiments of troops of color to serve in the Civil War. So, the pendulum has shifted and individual servicemen and women are on a more level playing field and are able to achieve based on their individual work. We will continue to pray for peace so that no one has to experience the mental, spiritual, or physical impacts of war. And while we pray, we can take comfort that our men and women, including African-American men and women, are still pioneering, they're still leading the way, and they're still being history makers and fighting to protect the freedoms that United States citizens hold so dear. Thank you again for this opportunity to speak. I never speak long, so I'm done. And if there's still dancing left to be done, I guess there's time. But I do appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, Colonel Osplin and Command Sergeant Major Harris will present to Ms. Wilson a token of appreciation on behalf of the soldiers and civilians <laughs> of the United States Army Training Center in Fort Jackson. Oh, thank you. So if we could, could we get one more round of applause for everybody that <laughs> performed, spoke, and the, the band and everybody else who were here. Uh, the, the combined effort for this, this event was outstanding. And a, a quick round of appreciation for, uh, for everybody who helped make this a great day. So uh, with that, Chaplain. If you'll bow your heads with me. Almighty God, what a great reminder that black history is American history. And may, as we leave this place, may we keep in mind, Lord, to see one another the way that you see us. May we extend love and peace as we depart. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.